Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. I've had a few folks reach out and express a bit of surprise that we've seen two separate ships called San Rose, both carrying Mathurin de Marais in, well, in succession. It's a cool coincidence, but really not that out of the ordinary. Remember, they were both Spanish frigates of 14 and 16 guns, respectively. Before they were captured, they were named Santa Rosa. Both of them probably were named after Santa Rosa de Lima, a real person, a nun born in Lima, Peru. Santa Rosa de Lima led an impressive life. We're not going to delve into it here, but if you're so inclined, it's worth looking into. Mostly, she's notable as the first person born in the Americas to be canonized as a saint. That's why we run into so many ships in Spanish America called Santa Rosa. Now, I don't intend to give the impression that that's why we see so many ships named Rose from other parts of the world. Most English ships, with some variation of Rose in the title, the Sally Rose accepted, are named after either the Tudor Rose or they go way back to the Wars of the Roses. Most famously, perhaps, was the Mary Rose, maybe the most famous English vessel of the Middle Ages. The Mary Rose was commissioned by Henry VIII way back in 1516 and named after his eldest daughter, Mary. She's so famous, though, because she was recovered from the ocean floor in 1982. It was an amazing feat of maritime archaeology and has taught us a huge amount about naval warfare in the late Middle Ages. For example, the Mary Rose could fire a full broadside, an innovation that many scholars thought came later. However, the Mary Rose was lost at sea in 1545. That's the very tale of the Middle Ages, right as the early modern era was beginning to bloom. She was lost in a battle between the French and the English, the Battle of Soleil, the last naval battle between France and England for 145 years. Until, that is, the Nine Years' War, when France and England fought the Battle of Bantry Bay. This is episode 182, The Battle of Bantry Bay. We're going to be concerned largely with Royal Navy ships today. The Battle of Bantry Bay was fought between the Royal Navies of England and France. The ship it might be best to begin with was HMS Newcastle. Newcastle was an old vessel. She was built in 1654. Her commission was part of Oliver Cromwell's western design. But in 1688, Newcastle was given over to a young and somewhat promising naval officer named George Churchill. You remember George Churchill, right? That's John Churchill's brother, the man who served under Sir John Narborough on the search for La Nuestra Señora. Well, George Churchill was a passable naval commander, but really nothing special. He got the job of captain in the Navy for two major reasons. First of all, he was a Tory, and that went a long way in the court of King James II. But more importantly, maybe... Most importantly, George Churchill's sister was sleeping with the king. It's all part of those fascinating sexual politics of the late Stuart era. Annabel Churchill, their sister, was a maid of honor to King James' wife, Anne Hyde. And that's when she began an affair with the king, and you should remember that group of girls. The Jennings sisters were also maids of honor to Anne Hyde, one of whom would go on to become Sarah Churchill, best friend of the Queen. It's all a very tight-knit little community there. But Annabel and George Churchill were staunch Tories. They were firmly in the camp of King James, Annabel especially firmly, while John Churchill and the rest of their family were staunch Whigs. Now, I'm not saying that the Churchills and the Jennings were hedging their bets by ensuring that someone in the family was sleeping with or befriending or bribing relevant people on both sides. But it does appear that they were playing both sides of the field. At least, it worked out that way. However, even though George Churchill was a James-supporting Tory, by the fall of 1888 he'd made the smart move and switched sides, and he did so in dramatic fashion. 
His commanding officer, Admiral of the Blue, Arthur Herbert, sailed yet another ship of note today, HMS Rupert, over to Amsterdam. He did so to deliver the invitation to William to invade. And it was just about that moment, when Arthur Herbert was in Amsterdam, that Captain George Churchill of HMS Newcastle noticed his ship was just full of leaks. I mean, a real death trap. Naturally, to save the life of his men, he had to put into Plymouth for repairs. And at which point, wouldn't you know it, all of the other captains in his fleet began to look around and notice a bunch of leaks of their own. They had this sudden plague of leaky hulls. The channel fleet was just, oh, it was just stricken. So naturally, they all had to put into Plymouth, too. Which, and I'm sure it's just coincidence here, but it perfectly coincided with William's fleet setting out from the continent to invade, led by Arthur Herbert, at the exact same moment that, and again I'm sure it's a coincidence, that John Churchill and a number of other prominent military men led an army conspiracy against the king, all of it backed by Parliament. Just coincidence. But George Churchill got a lot of credit for being the first to need repairs. It was a defection, and it earned George Churchill a place in the Navy after William took the throne. You might remember that purge of Jacobite Navy officers that claimed the careers of men like uh, Thomas Pound. But that didn't catch George Churchill. That's how, and why, he was still the master of the Newcastle a few months later, when the deposed King James sailed from Brest, in Brittany in France, to land an army of Jacobite loyalists and French soldiers in Ireland. That's the Williamite War, and we glossed over the Williamite War pretty hard when we talked about it. And really, we're not going to rectify that fact today. I will just say that William and James both had English and Irish units, and they were bolstered, respectively, by Dutch and French contingents. At first, it looked like James was doing pretty well. He had a few early victories. But then they ran into a wall of well-armed forts and armies in what would become Northern Ireland. The war at that point just kind of stalled out. It turned into that war for supplies, and that was a war that William was winning. He controlled sea lanes from Ireland to England and all the way to Holland. James, on the other hand, had to rely on supplies and reinforcements from France. Now, after the Glorious Revolution... Arthur Herbert was promoted to Lord High Admiral. His one job as Lord High Admiral was to stop the French from landing on either Ireland or Britain. To that end, he instituted a policy that would, well, really, it would change the Royal Navy forever. He called it, and coined the phrase, a fleet in being. That's a, a strategy in a time of war in which a nation with a superior navy would just keep a large fleet in port. That would force the enemy to deploy naval forces to defend against the mere threat of an invasion. That deployment would tie up their ships, and since their fleet was forced to go to sea in a defensive posture, it would also cost them a lot of money. And of course, if they didn't deploy those forces, they didn't tie up their ships and spend that money well, then the fleet in being would just invade. It's a brilliant innovation, all of it thanks to Arthur Herbert. Beyond that, though, Herbert was a controversial figure. My favorite controversy is the accusation that he was a, a foul-mouthed drunk in the habit of bringing at least two prostitutes on board whenever he went to sea. My kind of guy. However, most of those rumors have been debunked. More reputable were the delays in pay that plagued the Navy. It got so bad that here in 1689 and 1690, the Navy suffered a wave of strikes and mutinies and sailors just refusing to sail, which hit at just the wrong moment right when the French were preparing a fleet to make for Ireland. A fleet in being isn't much of a deterrent when the sailors won't sail. Which, of course, isn't to say that no sailors were willing to sail. George Churchill's ship, at this point, HMS Pendennis, was a 1,100-ton, 70-gun, third-rate ship of the line. She was ready to fight alongside 23 other ships. The other ship I want to note, especially here, is HMS Rupert, 
she was still fully manned and fully operational. Now at this point, Admiral Herbert was no longer captain of the Rupert. He was Lord High Admiral, after all. Instead, the Rupert was under Captain Francis Wheeler, and that's according to the ship's manifest, recorded in March 1689. The Rupert was a fine, fine vessel of the Royal Navy, a 790-ton, 64-gun, third-rate ship of the line. She was commissioned back in 1665 upon the official establishment of the Royal Navy. Samuel Pepys records in his famous diary, quote, The king, duke, and everybody, saying it is the best ship that was ever built. End quote. Now, it was no longer the best ship ever built. She was only a third-rate ship of the line, but an impressive and valuable craft nonetheless. She wasn't unique in this squadron guarding against French invasion. They had a ton of third rates in the Channel Fleet. But I'm mentioning HMS Rupert in particular here because of one man, a 30-year-old midshipman who presumably signed up in the wake of the Revolution. Or maybe it was that wave of strikes. I mean, if half the Channel Fleet suddenly refused to sail until they got their back pay, the Navy was likely recruiting, heavily, probably in the West Country, especially in places like Plymouth and Devon. And we all know how that kind of recruiting usually went, right? You're just minding your own business in a tavern somewhere, having a couple of drinks and maybe trying to catch the eye of the lady serving those drinks, when a friendly chap with a posh London accent saunters over and strikes up a conversation. Nice enough fellow, even offers to buy a round. Then another round. And then maybe a tot of rum. And then five or six more. Next thing you know, you're waking up with the worst hangover of your life. Your eyes are trying to crawl out of the sockets. Your tongue is two sizes too big. Your head is throbbing and... And the floor just won't sit still. It's spinning, and it's pulsating, and it's rising, and it's falling, and you think you're going to be sick. It's, well, it's almost like, oh, it's almost like you're on a ship. That was only one form the press gangs took. In that situation, you would wake up on a ship with a major headache and a contract lasting, usually until the war was over. Other men were impressed straight out of the stockades. Find yourself imprisoned, guilty of a crime, no problem, join the Navy, hey, you might live. Still others, though, were just knocked over the head and bundled aboard as little more than slaves. Some men were recruited in a more traditional fashion, something we would recognize from modern military recruiters. You know, they'd offer you pay and benefits. But at that point, who's going to take that deal? Half the Navy is currently on strike for unpaid wages. But some did, and we don't know how this particular midshipman arrived on board HMS Rupert. But the manifest of HMS Rupert, in March 1689, listed Henry Every as a crewman in good standing. And I should point out that Every was probably not press-ganged, violently or otherwise. He was a midshipman, which was an officer in the Royal Navy. It was the lowest officer rank available, but an officer nonetheless. E.T. Fox writes in King of the Pirates, quote, By Every's time, the role of midshipman had not quite evolved into the familiar one of a young man of good family entering the Navy to learn seamanship. Originally, the rank of midshipman was given to experienced seamen who were thought fit to become officers, so they might learn leadership as well as seamanship. End quote. Now, Fox brings up a couple of good points here, points that raise questions of class, to me at least. In Every's day, midshipmen were usually commoners, commoners that had a bit of education, certainly. They had to be able to read and to read maps. And usually they came from regions and families that provided some kind of seafaring experience, like the West Country. Henry Every was a perfect candidate for midshipmen at the time. Later on, though, by, you know, the height of the British Empire, midshipmen were almost always noble youths with noble parents, and they were serving a, a kind of apprenticeship. But they were officers here. They were the lowest officers, but still of the officer corps. That means that the, uh, the rabble, 
The regular crewmen of common birth had to defer to these young, spoiled, noble brats. But it was here in 1689 that the Navy was just beginning that transition. There were probably boys of a higher social caste serving alongside Henry Every. They would be equal in rank to the gruff sailor, but I can actually see the merits of that situation. If you've got a young man, 12 or 14, born to privilege but with promising naval prospects, I can only see it as a good thing for him to work alongside men of lower social standing, but men that can neither be ordered around by him nor order the boy around. You're forcing this noble youth to learn how to deal with people as people. The U.S. equivalent of the midshipman is the ensign. I imagine, and... Oh boy, am I sorry about this analogy, but imagine Wesley Crusher and Worf from Star Trek. Imagine that they held the same rank and they had to work together. There would be friction at first, absolutely, but eventually they'd work past that and learn to work together, and the Enterprise as a whole would be stronger for it. But beyond that, this system, under which Henry Every was made midshipman, provided a path of social and economic advancement for those of lower class, at least those with the merit to succeed. Naturally, though, once the Navy became a more desirable profession for people of quality, the wealthy and powerful could not allow the ranks to be sullied by those filthy, ignorant, detestable commoners. A ton of pearl-clutching nobles actually formally protested this arrangement later on. I mean, imagine it, our baby boy forced to mingle with the rabble, the horror, the scandal. They should be serving him punch and crumpets. <sighs> as far as Henry Every's conduct in the battle to come is concerned, we know very little. I won't be regaling you with feats of the Pirate King's early daring do. But we do know he's going to serve with distinction in the first naval battle fought between England and France in 145 years. In France, Marquis de chateau Renault, Vice Admiral Francois-Louis Rousset, was given command of 24 ships. They were carrying guns and rations and warm clothes and shoes and a pile of money and upwards of 5,000 soldiers. His job, above all, was to get those supplies and reinforcements past the English and on to the shores of Ireland, to bolster James, to give the deposed king the tools needed for victory. And we should remember Chateau Renault. He's going to be one of France's top naval commanders in this war, and specifically in relation to our story. Now, the French fleet was comprised mostly of third- and fourth-rate ships of the line. They had a handful of gunboats and fire ships, and when I say fire ships, it's just what you're thinking of. A smaller craft, usually, you know, a bark or a sloop, that was filled with bales of straw and hemp and barrels of pitch and even gunpowder, and crewed by a skeleton crew, whose only real job was to aim the ship at a blockade and light everything aflame and get off as fast as possible. The English fleet had a similar makeup, mostly third or fourth rates, and a few fire ships and two bomb ships. My favorite of those is the Fire Drake. But they also had, and this is important, a few frigates in their midst. They were classified as fifth rate ships of the line, which is mostly a distinction of tonnage and guns they carried, but really the frigate isn't designed for battles of the line. You know, they weren't made to line up and fire at the other side as long as possible. They're fast and mobile ships. They're well-armed, but they're, they're meant to flank the enemy line. You know, in my heart, first-rate indeed. Now, there were three landing sites realistically available to Chateau Renault. They were all on the southwest coast of Ireland. The first two were two large port cities, Cork and Kinsale. They were held by forces either friendly to James II or neutral. They were really the best possible locations for the French. They were the goal. But then you had, just about as far southwest as Ireland goes, a lightly populated bay called Bantry. And it wasn't exactly a port city there at Bantry Bay, but more of a village on a secluded cove that was frequented by... Irish nationalists and pirates. 
who, you know, were usually the same people. Most of Admiral Herbert's forces, by April of 1689, were patrolling the waters of southwest Ireland around Cork and Kinsale. It was the logical location to patrol. It was the 6th of May that Chateau Renault departed Brest in Brittany. He took his fleet wide out into the Atlantic to avoid any English patrols he might run into, but by the 10th of May he was bringing the fleet back in toward Ireland. Now Chateau Renault sent out a frigate to scout Kinsale, the more southwest of the two port cities. If the English were, by chance, foolish enough to have left it unguarded, then the operation here would be a breeze, a quick in-and-out job with no fighting at all. But Kinsale was not unguarded. An English lookout, one of Admiral Herbert's men, spotted the French ship, and both of them immediately jumped into action. The Frenchmen came about and opened up full sail to get back to their fleet. The English did the same, but, you know, the other direction. However, within the hour, both fleets were racing south and west around the coast of Ireland. When Admiral Herbert arrived where the French ship had been spotted, and there was no sight of him or Chateau Renault, he sent a few frigates off to search the coast, just in case they were hiding there, but the mass of the English fleet headed on to the only location left to the French, Bantry Bay. Herbert arrived on the morning of the 11th of May, and really he was too late. The French were already ensconced in Bantry Bay. They were unloading their supplies on to Ireland. But at a glance, though, it looked like the English had the French trapped. There was no way for the French to escape except through the English line. But the French were ready for this. Chateau Renault ordered his fire ships lit and sent them toward the English. Now this wasn't some kind of surprise attack here. If you're a ship's captain and you see a smaller craft that sets a heading right at your line, and then you see all of her boats depart back to the enemy fleet, you know what's coming. Soon enough, she's going to burst into flames and strike your flagship, and a hellstorm of fire and death is going to rain down upon you. Now, it was occasionally a successful surprise, usually when it happened at night, as we will see much later on in this story at the blockade of Nassau. But most often it was completely telegraphed. You knew it was coming. Because that maneuver is not really designed to actually hit the enemy line. I mean, that would be great, but the enemy was going to move. It was designed to break the enemy line. And it did, here. Herbert's fleet, when they saw the fire ships coming for them, scattered out of the bay. They didn't lose a single vessel from the fire ship, but the French and Chateau Renault were no longer trapped. That's when they moved. Some of his ships were still unloading the last of the cargo, but those that weren't burst out of the bay and opened fire on the English. They were doing so right as the English were trying to reform their line. It, Well, that hit the English as a surprise. It was a, a ruthless hit, just smashed into them. But that is what the frigates were for. The English frigates, who were not required to form the line, swung around and engaged the French on her flanks. They tied up all of the French gunners, which allowed the English to get into position. There's a reason that pirates, if possible, preferred a frigate. And here, at long last, the two fleets were properly arrayed for a proper battle of the line. They could engage as God intended gentlemen of the sea to fight, which, that is to say... The story gets mind-numbingly boring. You know, when ships of the line fought in a battle of the line, they just kind of sat there in a line and fired at each other. And yeah, I'm sure that that was pretty exciting for the people involved. They were being pelted with hot iron and lead balls that tore through wood and flesh alike for hours on end, in this case for four hours. But there's not much tale to tell there beyond, you know, the misery of it all. As for Henry Every, well, we don't know what he was doing during the fight. You know, no one wrote down the exploits of this lone midshipman. But we can glean a little bit. He must have proven himself to be a capable sailor, even a decent enough officer, in the fight. See, after Bantry Bay was over, Every was promoted to a mate of HMS Rupert's sailing master. Now, E.T. Fox suggests that he was probably the lowest master's mate on the totem pole, but David F. Marley says in Pirates of the Americas that Henry Avery was chief mate. 
Now, I'm inclined to lean toward Fox on this one. It's not impossible that Henry Every was made chief mate. I mean, maybe his conduct was just stellar in the battle. But for a promotion like that, he'd have to be, you know, swinging over to the enemy ship and cutting down her captain in single combat. More likely, everyone in front of him in line was killed in the battle, so Every was able to jump up the ladder a few rungs. But again, most likely, I think Every was probably promoted to the lowest master's mate. That's really how nearly all midshipmen advanced in their career. They would go from midshipman to master's mate and then work their way up the ranks of master's mates, and then, after a couple of years doing that, they could test for lieutenant. If they passed that test, and it was not an easy test, but if they passed, they would be moved into the proper officer corps, no longer a junior officer. And you know, wouldn't, well, wouldn't Star Trek have been cooler if, when, you know, Wesley failed his Starfleet Academy entrance exam, he captured a starship and headed out into the black for a little good old-fashioned space piracy? And then, you know, when that, when that big Borg battle happens, he could show up with a fleet of stolen Klingon warbirds and drop his cloaking shield and show off his top-of-the-line Borg tech that just, you know, wrecks the bad guys. And then there could be this moment, you know, when the Federation is about to attack the pirates even though they saved the day, but Picard steps up and talks them down because he knows the true heart of Wesley Crusher. But then, of course, Wesley somehow absconds with the Federation starship. I mean... You know, I should really cut this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to let this go out. Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember to cut this, Matt. Okay. <clears throat> the Battle of Bantry Bay was, in the end, inconclusive. Neither side won the fight, and both limped off to lick their wounds. But the French operation to get their supplies to Ireland was a success. Chateau Renault bought plenty of time for the French to unload, and that... Well, the immediate effect of that was the Battle of the Boyne, which took place on the 1st of July. The Boyne was the first major fight between William and James in Ireland, but it was a, a decisive Williamite victory. However, the lingering effects of the Battle of Bantry Bay were much more widespread. This fight proved to both sides that they would really have to up their naval game moving forward. They needed more ships and more sailors and more impressment, which means more disgruntled sailors, and in the New World, they were going to need a whole lot more privateers. We're going to talk about those privateers and the events in New England in two weeks' time. Next time we're going to take a break from the narrative of our story, and we're going to talk about some of the concepts of piracy. You know, big stuff, the political and economic and the social structure of piracy. I recently got my hands on a book. The publishing house, PM Press, sent me over a copy for free, for, you know, consideration, which I love. Now, I'm not getting paid or anything, but the book was interesting, and it raised some questions that I'd like to discuss today. The book in question is Life Under the Jolly Roger, Reflections on the Golden Age of Piracy, by Gabriel Kuhn. Now, it's unapologetically written from a radical perspective. Gabriel Kuhn is an anarchist philosopher, and P.M. Press specializes in radical books. I was curious as to how I would feel about this book. I wondered, well, I've read a lot of books about piracy, books from all kinds of different perspectives, and I've seen a lot of them that were full of bias, or more commonly that were trying to fit the story of pirates into a modern narrative. I can't tell you how many interesting-sounding books I've had to basically toss out because I couldn't take them seriously. But to my delight, this book, Life Under the Jolly Roger, was neither of those things. The author writes with a perspective. He acknowledges that going in. He's upfront about it. For example, he writes in the introduction, quote, 
An important aspect of this venture is the desire to go beyond a certain antagonism that seems to have developed over the last decade with respect to the political interpretation of the golden age of piracy. On the one hand, there are scholars who insist that the real world of the pirates was harsh, tough, and cruel, and that the pirates acquired a romantic aura, which they certainly never deserved. On the other hand, there are those who maintain that these outlaws led audacious, rebellious lives, and that we should remember them as long as there are powerful people and oppressive circumstances to be resisted. The ideological assumptions behind these two perspectives are as clear as their respective consequences. While for the adherents of the former, pirates tend to get a better press than they deserve, often being admired for their laid-back lifestyle and praised as proto-revolutionaries or democrats, rather than condemned as the murderers and thieves that most of them were. The adherents of the latter embrace Marcus Redeker's perception that pirates were rebels who challenged in one way or another the conventions of class, race, gender, and nation, expressed high ideals, and abolished the wage, established a different discipline, practiced their own kind of democracy and equality, and provided an alternative model for running the deep-sea ship. In the end, both sides accuse the other of substituting fiction for fact. And then he concludes, Although this book is written from a radical perspective, I will try to avoid this debate for several reasons. End quote. And then he goes on to give those reasons, all of which seemed pretty reasonable to me. Mostly, it's given the lack of reputable primary sources, and of course the subsequent romanticization of pirates. It's not a debate that can be decided or really honestly argued. Instead, what we have here is an author that's looking at the golden age of piracy honestly and drawing conclusions that are applicable to today's world. I, I respect that, even when I don't necessarily agree with the conclusions that the author comes up with, but they're not rewriting history. Instead, they're trying to learn from it. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've run into either sources or occasionally real people who have tried to tell me how pirate ideology fits in perfectly with their modern ideology. And it's always an extreme, right? They're always either A, trying to push an ethno-state, or B, trying to push the abolition of the state. This book doesn't do that. I found it to be a really worthwhile read, especially if you're a person that has an interest in political science or radical politics or an innovative take on pirate historiography. It's fascinating. Also, there's a ton of stuff in it about marginalized people, women, racial minorities, people with handicaps, that kind of thing, that rarely get talked about properly in other pirate sources. Plus, and this is a big one for me, it's really well written. So, you know, if it sounds like something you're interested in, I suggest you check it out. With that said, I'm not going to say much more about Life Under the Jolly Roger. I don't want to, you know, just give everything away. It is a worthwhile read, and I want to be able to fold it into my sources to make me sound smart. But it does raise some questions that I would like to discuss today. I want to look at some of the radical or even revolutionary ideologies that have been attributed to pirates. So often I hear people say that pirates were proto-capitalists, or pirates were proto-socialists, or pirates were proto-republicans, or pirates were anarchists. I hear all of these, and today we're going to begin to examine those claims. This is episode 183, Outlaw Brotherhood. There are a few points I'd like to note right out of the gate. First, nearly everything today we're going to talk about is going to be based in the Western tradition, more specifically the European tradition. You know, the pirates that we talk about on this show, with the exception of a brief digression into Barbary piracy, have all been operating in or subject to the European sphere of influence. Now, they haven't all been European, of course. There have been pirates from native peoples like the Kuna and the Mosquito. And, of course, there have been pirates of African heritage. 
Peter T. Leeson writes in his excellent article entitled Anarchy. Quote, a sample of 700 pirates active in the Caribbean between 1715 and 1725, for example, reveals that 35% were English, 25% were American, 20% were West Indian, 10% were Scottish, 8% were Welsh, and 2% were Swedish, Dutch, French, and Spanish. Others came from Portugal, Scandinavia, Greece, and East India. Pirate crews were also racially diverse. Based on data available from 23 pirate crews active between 1682 and 1726, the racial composition of ships varied between 13 and 98 percent black. If this sample is representative, 25 to 30 percent of the average pirate crew was of African descent. End quote. Now I'm going to just skip over the unbelievable audacity of Leeson in using that title. Anarchy. At least, you know, doing so before I could. But all of those pirates he was mentioning, be they Greek or Scottish or of African descent, they were all operating in a colonial world. A world that was built by Europeans, and often, in the case of those of African descent, it was to their sorrow. But in that vein, the ideas we're going to be talking about today are going to be the European version of ideas and philosophies that were mostly based in Western thought. I suppose, though, to begin, we should take a look at those philosophies, but with, you know, the broadest possible brush. And when I talk about these philosophies, I'm going to be talking about the very early versions of them. These are not their modern counterparts we're talking about. They are living and evolving ideas that impact our real world right now, today. But their relevance to Golden Age pirates, if in fact there is any at all, I would argue comes from the closest chronological versions of the ideas. The first of these I would like to note, the closest to the Golden Age of piracy, chronologically speaking, is capitalism. Now, if you don't consider capitalism a revolutionary ideology, I would point you to the year 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. However, we're not going to be spending a lot of time on capitalism today, mostly because the birth of capitalism and topics like the Protestant work ethic are kind of a background theme all throughout the entire era of piracy. Recall our talk about mercantilism? That system popular in the early modern era in which the state was the controlling interest in all agricultural and industrial and financial business interests, in which all capital, by default, belonged to the state and was doled out to its people as the state saw fit. Well, the basic tenet of capitalism is the belief that agricultural and industrial interests, what Karl Marx would go on to call the means of production, should be owned not by the state, but by private owners. And in our story, in the world of the pirates, we're beginning to see this shift already, especially in Protestant nations like England and the Netherlands. We have private merchant shipping and private Puritan colonial businesses. Mercantilism was still alive and well at the time, but smaller concerns were taking shape. The basic idea here is that Farmers could own their own farms and enjoy the profits of their labor. Manufacturers, who were mostly, at the time, small artisans, you know, think like cobblers, well, they could own their own shops outside of the restrictive guild system and enjoy the profits of their labor. Sounds great, right? Well, problems naturally arose. Instead of small farmers enjoying the profits of their own labor, we have giant plantation owners enjoying the profits of the labor of thousands of slaves. Instead of artisans making and selling shoes and enjoying the profits of their own labor, you have factories with a division of labor and owners enjoying the profits of thousands of employees. What certain ideologies we're going to talk about today would call wage slaves. But I hear you saying, hey, hey, hey now, <laughs> 
I'm an employee. It's not some disgusting, exploitative system. I hear some of you saying the opposite, and I'm not going to argue a side, but a lot of people would disagree with that. We're at right about 1800 here, and by that point the shortcomings of capitalism were becoming apparent to pretty much everybody. And you know it's not some kind of radical left thing. There were people working 18-hour days, six, seven days a week, still unable to feed their families. It was a problem everybody recognized, but the question on everybody's mind was, how do we solve it? And there were two schools of thought here. On the one hand, you could regulate and legislate the problem away. That's what we here in the Anglosphere did. In fact, that's what most places that had some sort of representative government did. It's the natural step to take in a republic, for example. But it is an imperfect system. It takes time to legislate and regulate. And the results are often less than what were hoped for. However, on the other side of that coin... You have places like France, 1793. But they started out fighting for those rights. You know, they had the Declaration of the Rights of Man. They had the establishment of a legislature. They had a constitution. All things that most people in the modern world can get behind. But then you have the Reign of Terror. You have the guillotine. You have the absolute death of the rule of law. It turned into a real mess. Now... We're not here to delve into the story of the French Revolution or debate the merits of the Revolution. But it was in the chaos of the Revolution that two ideals were either given birth or given form. Socialism and anarchism. Socialism came first, and the basic tenet of socialism is the belief that agricultural and industrial interests, what Karl Marx would call the means of production should be owned not by the state, but by the workers. Not single private owners with employees, but all of the workers coming together to collectively own the industry that they operate. That's the need to seize the means of production, right? And that means just what it sounds like. The means of production are the tools and the raw materials and the factories and everything needed to produce goods. And that claim, you need to seize the means of production, was not some philosophical ideal. It was a literal call to arms in the moment, right now. That's Karl Marx saying, hey, you, if you hate your job and you want to quit getting screwed by your boss, you need to take his factory over by force. Only then, according to Marx, can the people in the farms and the factories really begin to enjoy the profits of their labor. Because this solution, this socialist solution, was attempting to solve the same problems that capitalism was attempting to solve. However, problems naturally arose. Instead of the people, the proletariat, enjoying the profits of their own labor, you have the state, who claimed to represent the people, but they controlled all of the profits of all of the labor, and they redistributed it as they saw fit. Which sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? When you break down the Soviet Union, it starts to look quite a bit like a mercantilist state. Imperial expansion? Check. Slave labor? Check. State-controlled industry and economy? Check and double-check. Theocratic absolute monarchs destined by God himself to rule? Well, okay, lots of that stuff. But that brings us, finally, to the third solution to these issues that we're going to talk about today. It's the political and financial system that is most often associated with pirates. When I started this show, a friend of mine asked me, aren't pirates really just drunken anarchists? And at the time I said yes. However, now, after a lot of reading and a lot of thought, I would say, well, yes, but also no. So what is anarchism? And to be fair, I'm really not the person to answer this question. To be honest, I've really never understood anarchism, but I've, I've tried. At its root, you know, the dictionary definition Anarchism is a system in which the people live under no government. The word 
Anarchism is based in the Greek. If a monarchy is the rule of one, a mono, and an oligarchy is the rule of a few, anarchy is the rule of none. But that's barely even beginning to scratch the surface. Anarchism means a world in which the state itself doesn't exist. Beyond that, it's a world in which structures of power and hierarchy and coercion are all just abolished. And what that means, practically speaking, really begins to depend on who you ask. The end result is supposed to be a world in which all people are free and equal. And that sounds great, right? But I've yet to find any kind of practical roadmap to that utopian end from any source. I would be remiss in discussing early anarchism, even in the broadest and likely inaccurate possible terms, if I did not mention, though, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Proudhon was a French philosopher. He was born in the wake of the French Revolution. But Proudhon played a large role in the revolutions of 1848. The statement, the idea that, quote, property is theft, was from Proudhon's pen. Now, he was a socialist at first, a contemporary of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. He knew them. They were, for a time, friends. But his plans for a socialist world seem to have been mostly based on worker collectives and communal living, which flew in the face of what Marx and Engels were talking about. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, realizing that there was a divide between himself and the rest of the socialist movement, declared himself an anarchist. Maybe the first official anarchist. But after his death, the theory of anarchism began to splinter into dozens of different varieties of anarchism. You've got, you know, anarcho-communism and libertarian socialism, and there are just far too many to even begin to name. I think, and those that are better versed in modern anarchist theory, might scream to the heavens about how wrong I am, but it seems to me that the closest modern corollary to Proudhon's anarchic ideas is anarcho-syndicalism. Again, I'm not sure, and I'm not going to dig myself any deeper here, but all of this, now that we understand essentially the history of the world from, say, 1786 to, you know, yesterday, brings us to the question at hand. Are pirates capitalists? Are pirates socialists? Are pirates anarchists? Well, yes, but also no. If we look at the socio-economic ideas discussed here today, we would find elements of all three in pirates and piracy. But the real innovation that pirates offered the world is one that we have not yet talked about, at least today. Pirate ships and the pirate world were democratic. They voted on everything. That form of governance could, and I would argue should, be the basis for every type of societal arrangement. You know, I believe in the will of the people, be it large, sprawling nation-states or city-states or small communal living, I think the people should choose how to run their lives. I don't care if you're capitalist or communist or anarchist or whatever, I believe in voting as a way of making the big decisions. So instead of looking at all of those forms of organization and trying to fit the pirates into that mold, I want to look at some typical pirate activities and see what latter-day philosophies may or may not apply. Let's begin at the beginning, before a pirate crew even sets out for their voyage. Marcus Redeker writes in Villains of All Nations, quote, In their founding moment, after a mutiny or when the crew of an overcrowded vessel split and formed a new pirate ship, the crew came together to elect their captain, draw up their articles, and declare to be true to each other and their flag. End quote. But of course pirates voted on more than just the captain. The quartermaster was perhaps the most important officer on board a pirate ship, as far as, you know, the crew was concerned. Captain Charles Johnson, in a general history of the pirates, writes, quote, We may say the quartermaster is a humble imitation of the Roman tribune of the people. 
he speaks for and looks after the interest of the crew. End quote. But what I want to talk about here are the Articles of Agreement, the Pirate Code. Those codes were really a defining characteristic of what made pirates pirates. Now, Alexander Squimelin tells us of the buccaneer codes of the Brethren of the Coast, Henry Morgan especially. Article 2 of Henry Morgan's Code says, quote, Compensation is provided the captain for the use of his ship, and the salary of the carpenter, or shipwright, who mended, careened, and rigged the vessel. End quote. Jean Charpin's Code, which we only just talked about, opens, quote, copy of charter made between M. Charpin, commanding the Saint Rose, and his crew, who agreed to give him ten lots for himself and command of his ship. End quote. That's twice in the Buccaneer era that we see extra shares allotted for the use of his ship. That denotes, of course, the ownership of the vessel. That's private property, private property for which the private owner is to be compensated. That is a capitalistic virtue if ever I heard one. Henry Morgan's Code even makes an allotment for the captain to receive extra shares so he can pay a salary? But those are buccaneer codes. What about, you know, real pirates? Well, perhaps the most famous pirate code of all time that of Black Bart Roberts. It reads, quote, The captain and quartermaster to receive two shares of a prize, the master, boatswain, and gunner one share and a half, and other officers one and quarter. End quote. That's a lot closer to equal than the ten shares of the buccaneers. There's no mention of ownership anywhere in his articles or any of the other Latter-day Pirates. That's bringing us more and more into a, what we might consider today, a socialist organization. Perhaps most telling to me, though, was the advent of pirate councils. Now, we haven't talked much about the pirate council here on this show, not yet at least. Mostly because they weren't really a thing for the buccaneers, but they're going to become more and more important as we move on. Those councils are going to be elected by the crew to debate and decide issues alongside the captain and the quartermaster, and really they're just as important an office as captain and quartermaster. There are a lot of possible comparisons we could make between these councils on board a pirate ship and modern-day political structures. But what it really makes me think of are workers' councils, so popular in the Soviet Union. That's where the Soviet Union got their name, even. Workers' councils were called Soviets, and in theory, those Soviets were the basis on which government was to be based. Now, that's not how it worked out, but that was the idea. Or, if we were to look at a more anarchic organization, many anarcho-syndicalist structures eventually concede the need for some kind of decision-making council. Now, this is controversial among a lot of anarcho-syndicalists, but in that case, the members are to be obviously voted on, and they bring most of the big decisions before the community as a whole. They still vote, but day-to-day -day administration is handled by a council. That, more than a, you know, a workers' coalition, a Soviet, that strikes me as a strong similarity between pirates and anarchists. And when it comes to decisions or problems that might affect those beyond the commune, problems that might affect multiple communes, a council of councils is required. Sometimes, and this is even more problematic for a lot of anarchists, but sometimes that council of councils is called a commonwealth. Gabriel Kuhn devotes an entire chapter to this topic in his book, and, oh boy, do I love it, it's fascinating stuff. But he writes, quote, The versions of pirate articles that existed on different ships appeared so similar in essence that they indeed constituted a common golden age pirate culture. 
or, in Frank Sherry's words, a commonwealth. Kuhn continues, later on, quote, The term brotherhood has been used extensively to describe the strong sense of loyalty, solidarity, and community among buccaneers and pirates. The buccaneers have been called an autarkic brotherhood, or a brotherhood of sea sharks. The Golden Age pirates, an outlaw brotherhood. End quote. Now, after the officers and the councils were elected, and after the code was agreed to, and after the pirates spent a couple of days toasting their accomplishment with heroic amounts of rum and wine and beer, the pirates had to get to work. Whenever pirates spotted a ship on the horizon, the very first order of business was to vote on whether or not to attack. If they voted aye, they attacked. After the big guns were done firing, if they had been needed in the first place, the pirates prepared to go over. When all was said and done, a pirate crew would have, hopefully, a big pile of plunder, but also supplies and a crew and a ship to decide what to do with. Again, most of this was voted on. Now, more often than not, the pirates agreed to release the crew. That's one of the unspoken rules of the Commonwealth. If you go around killing people willy-nilly, that's going to upset a lot of people. People in the civilized world with more ships and more guns who are going to use those against you. But then you have the plunder, and the plunder was divided into equal shares. They made allotments for certain officers, as we have seen, and for injuries. In the buccaneer era, an injured man was given either an extra portion or sometimes a slave. But by the time of Bartholomew Roberts, things had changed. Black Bart Roberts' pirate code reads, quote, If any man should lose a limb or become a cripple in their service, he was to have $800 out of the public stock, and for lesser hurts proportionally. End quote. $800 out of the public stock. That, my friends, is a social security program. $800 was a good amount of money in those days, enough to set yourself up with a place to live and food to eat at the very least. Any man or woman who was part of the crew, at least in Robert's case, anybody who was seriously injured, so injured that they could not continue on, they were to be provided for. They weren't left to starve and die, and they did so out of a public treasury. That is a socialist program. We have social security in nearly all capitalist countries, of course, but... Well, for example, when social security was instituted here in the U.S., there was a flood of accusations against FDR. People called him a red and a secret communist agent and all sorts of nonsense. They did the same thing when he instituted the 40-hour work week and the minimum wage. That is a socialist program on board a pirate ship, and... Honestly, it's very progressive for the time. You know, factories 100, 100, 200 years later did not have social security programs. Governments wouldn't come up with that until the 20th century. But then we come to the supplies and the guns and the ship. What do we do as pirates with those tools? In some cases, although far from all cases, but occasionally the pirates would seize those guns and ships by force. And they would use them as tools to provide an income for the pirates to enjoy. It looks kind of like Karl Marx's call to arms to seize the means of production. I've seen a lot of arguments that that was exactly what it was. That pirates were a a proto-socialist, revolutionary, anti-imperialist movement, and every time they attacked, you know, an East India Company ship, it was an anti-imperialist action. And I do see the similarities there, but I have to disagree. See, the means of production are, what did we say, the tools and the factories, the raw materials necessary for production? But production is not what pirates did. You know, if you're a socialist workers' collective and you seize the means of production, the belief is that you're going to start making, you know, steel or tanks or bullets or whatever you need to make society run. But pirates didn't 
build anything. They didn't produce anything. What they did, and what was honestly an anti-imperialist action, but they extracted the wealth from those imperial powers for their own use. And sure, those ships, those tools of trade, were a means of production for the imperial powers themselves, but pirates turned that use on its head. More accurately, I would say that pirates seized the means of destruction. So, were pirates socialists? I don't... I don't think they were. There are similarities, some big similarities. The quest for a relative social equality among their ranks, that's a big one. But the goals between socialist revolutionaries of the 20th century and pirates of the late 17th and early 18th century, well, they're just not the same. And were pirates, and this is the big question, were they anarchists? First, we can't really know. You know, pirates, even when they occasionally wrote down their actions, they were writing down their actions. They weren't writing treatises on Enlightenment-era philosophy. There's not a single instance, at least not that I've run into, of a pirate saying, here's what I believe, aside from very occasionally naming something that they hate. And what they hated was often the government. They rejected their governments in almost all occasions, especially as we delve into the golden age of piracy. But also, on other occasions, take when Woods Rogers offered a pardon to all of the Nassau pirates They embraced their government and the mercantilist, burgeoning capitalist world they created. And then, of course, there's the fact that pirates were a lot of different people. They didn't share a homogeneous ideology. There were pirates who I'm certain did believe in an ethno-state, and I'm sure there were pirates who believed in no state at all. You can't say that this is what pirates were because there were just so many of them. But if I were gun to my head, forced to pin an ideology down that did define pirates and piracy as a whole, it would not be anarchy. It would be hydrarchy. We've talked about hydrarchy before, but it's going to become a much more important element in our story moving forward. And hydrarchy does share a lot of elements with later anarchist thinkers. But the traditions and beliefs of the hydrarchy, such as they were, Well, they were based in naval traditions and maritime traditions. The pirates might not have believed in their government, and that their government had failed them so completely, but I don't think that we could say pirates believed in the absence of a state as an ideal towards which to work. They were, of course, hostis humani generis, enemies of the whole human race, and that means they had no nation, but... When a pirate was asked from whence they were come, they had an answer. Pirates were from the sea. If the question of what pirates believed could even be answered, we're not going to answer it today. It's going to be a subject, though, that I do want you to keep an open mind to. We're going to return to this subject occasionally moving forward, whenever it becomes relevant to our overall story. Again, if this is a topic that intrigues you, I really can't recommend Life Under the Jolly Roger enough. It is a fascinating read, and it raises a lot of questions and points that I don't see raised many other places. Next time, though, we're going to return to our story. We're going to talk New England, King William's War, and the privateers that were empowered by the brief tenure of a German governor. We last visited New England at the outbreak of King William's War, the North American theater of the Nine Years' War. That's what the history books call it, at least, but honestly, this conflict was going to break out regardless of what Louis XIV was doing in the Rhineland. Which isn't to say that the Nine Years' War had nothing to do with what was happening in North America. A state of open warfare between France and England and the Netherlands, and basically the rest of Europe, did make the fighting in North America much more severe. When we left off, the 
war in America was really heating up. Recall the escalating raids by both French and English forces and their Native American allies. Recall that they culminated in the August 1689 raid on Pimiquid, modern-day Bristol, Maine. The English commander, Major Church, who was sent up to fight off the first French raid with ease, but then who left, who was not there when the French returned with a large force of Wabanaki warriors. And recall the slaughter of the men and boys of Pimiquid, the capture of the women and girls, and a few of the men, one of whom escaped to tell a tale of beatings and mass rape and real horror at the hands of the Wabanaki. Now I believe that this tale happened. I believe that when Major Church returned to Fort Loyal from Boston, he discovered a shocking scene. Bodies littering the landscape. The ground was still wet with blood. The walls were still smoldering. I believe him that it took days to gather and bury all of the dead found there. What I find curious, and really what I've yet to find any good reason for, is Major Church's return to Boston after the initial French raid. It's, it's an odd move. Now, am I saying, you know, Pimiquid was an inside job? Of course not. What I am asking is... You know, qui bono, who benefits here? It is convenient that what appears to be rank incompetence did allow the massacre to happen and allowed what followed to happen. As you might imagine, the people of Boston were furious. You know, something has to be done here. Retribution must be claimed. And retribution would be claimed. But the means were horrifying. This is episode 184, The Battle of Port Royal. Thus far, all of the fighting that we've talked about has occurred in what we know today as the state of Maine. There was also fighting in contested territory between New York and Canada, but we'll talk about that at a later date. At this point in time, though, Maine was also contested. It was claimed by both the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the French Colony of Acadia. Acadia comprised the Acadian Peninsula, as well as a swath of the mainland that stretched all the way to the St. Lawrence River. Now, the cities of Quebec and Montreal, or Mount Royal, existed at the time on the St. Lawrence, but they were not part of the colony of Acadia. They belonged to the Canada colony. Acadia's capital, really her only city of any real size, was Port Royal. Look at a map and you'll see that Port Royal rested on the bay between the Acadian Peninsula and the Canadian mainland. It had excellent access to the sea and was in a fantastic defensible position. It looked, frankly, not unlike the defenses set up around Port Royal, Jamaica. When Major Church returned to Boston with news of what had happened in Maine, the people were up in arms. You know, actually up in arms they were ready to go kill some Frenchmen, and Port Royal was the most likely target. They were readying militia forces and preparing an all-out expedition. But then, that's when Jacob Leisler, a German-born merchant and commander in the New York militia, took command of the New York colonial government. Leisler was not appointed by anyone, except, I guess, himself and a bunch of middle-class merchants that were fed up with the rich guys running the show in New York. But this was a moment in New England filled with menace. No one in Boston, or Providence, or anywhere else really, knew exactly how Leisler was going to govern, or what his aims as governor were going to be. Massachusetts held their militia back, just in case. They might have to defend against New York, or who knows, they might be called upon by King William to invade New York. The plans to counterattack the people of Acadia, their plans for retribution, were all put on the back burner for the moment. To the people of Boston and the Massachusetts colony, it looked kind of like those plans had been completely abandoned. Now, we need to remember here that many of those who had been there in Pimiquid, those who had been killed and raped and tortured, some of whom were maybe still alive out there somewhere, Those people had family in Boston. Some of those were influential members of the community. Those influential people were vocal about their displeasure. They were angry 
that their retribution had been postponed. The Massachusetts colony took note of their displeasure. However, they took real note of those who were less influential. The farmers and fishermen who also had family up in Maine, who had been lost. The government noted their pitchforks and torches and muskets and soldiers. In an effort to avoid yet another revolution there in Boston, and to keep those angry militiamen busy, the governor in Boston gave his permission for a private counterattack against Acadia. But before all of that, they needed someone to lead this expedition. There were a number of options to choose from. Most were from among those influential and vocal citizens. However, the governor wanted somebody from the government in charge. I mean, that should be obvious, right? You can see the benefits. You've got oversight. And then, of course, you want military experience. But the man chosen by the government of Massachusetts offered neither of those benefits. The oversight we'll get to, but the military experience, well, the man they chose had never served in any military body. He did, however, know Maine. He was from Maine. He had been a shipwright up there at one point, that is, until he talked his way into two separate expeditions to go hunting for La Nuestra Senora. The man chosen to lead this expedition was none other than that silver-tongued provost marshal, William Phipps. But with a leader now in place, what this expedition needed were guns and ships and more men. So where would you, a one-time treasure hunter with a history of employing buccaneers under a pay-for-prey contract, where would you find a host of well-trained, privately armed soldiers that had their own guns and their own ships? I know that you're sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for an answer, so I'll just go ahead and end the suspense. William Phipps turned to a bunch of pirates. There are only a few names I can conclusively give you. William Phipps led the expedition from the deck of a 42-gun, 120-man flagship called Six Friends. That was under a Captain Gregory Sugars. Sugars was one of those influential men who was considered to lead the voyage before Phipps was tacked on. He wasn't a pirate here, he was a Puritan. The other ship really, really worth noting here is the 16-gun Swan. Swan was under a Captain Thomas Griffin, a privateer currently operating out of Bermuda. That little tidbit, though, out of Bermuda, that is an immensely suggestive piece of information. Bermuda is going to be a center of early Pirates of the Round activity. Now at this time, 1689-1690, Bermuda had only been a crown colony for six years. Until 1684, it was under the administration of the Summers Isles Company. And here, in its very early days, Bermuda's crown governance was a, it was a wild west. It was rife with corruption and graft and a lot of piracy. Their governor, their brand new governor, a man named Isaac Richer, had the power granted him by the king to issue commissions. And that was a power that he used a lot. In 1690, he granted two men commissions. Well, a lot more than that, but two that we need to concern ourselves with today. The first was Thomas Griffin. But Griffin's partner, I, I guess literally his partner in crime, was George Dew. That's the same George Dew from the Second Pacific Adventure. The same who was there at the definitely real Last Council of the Brethren of the Coast. And the same George Dew who presumably got out of San Domingue as fast as possible when it became clear that all of the French were getting letters of mark to attack the English. George Dew also had a commission out of Bermuda, and his own ship, but that raises an interesting possibility. A year or so later, in 1691, Thomas Griffin and George Dew will return to Bermuda to renew their commissions. And at that time, they will be in the company of a 70-ton ship called Amity, in the hands of none other than Captain Thomas II. The probability that Thomas II was already among their number here in 1690 is high. 
If Thomas II was there, we don't know if he was a captain. And if he was a captain, we do know that he was not in command of the Amity. That would come later. However, whether or not Tu was there, there's another pirate who was about to become famous that may have been there. The pirate Richard Wunt is less well known than Captain Kidd or Henry Avery or Thomas Tu, but he shouldn't be. I think of Wunt kind of like uh, Pierre Le Picard. You know, he never hit the really big scores and he never gained the infamy that they provided, but he was always there. He was a part of everything. We need to remember the pirate Richard Wunt. And I think he was probably there in 1690 when William Phipps was recruiting privateer ships for the attack on Acadia. But who was not there of consequence? Well, despite some reports that he was around after the fact, William Kidd was not there. Henry Avery was also not there. He was busy serving on a king's ship. More interesting to me, though, is the absence of Bachelor's Delight. George Rayner and his crew were busy. We'll discuss that at another time. For now, though, William Phipps had a force of some 200 Massachusetts militiamen. One frigate, five sloops, barks, and catches, and perhaps as many as 300 privateers to sail them. The usual number given for the invasion force is 446 men. The time for revenge against the French for their depredation against Pemaquid had finally come. The fleet set sail on 28th April, 1690. What is to follow will not be a grand battle. The fort there at Port Royal was in the poorest imaginable shape. A few months earlier, in October of 1689, a royal engineer arrived from Paris to begin a renovation of the fort at Port Royal. That's a full year after the Nine Years' War had begun. Hostilities had commenced. But it does kind of make sense from a certain antiquated point of view. Traditionally, October was the end of season for military maneuvers. You know, that's when you had to bring the serfs back from the front to start harvesting crops. It's when you would send in engineers to repair the damage that trebuchets had done to your castle, that kind of thing. But this was 1690. It was not 1345. And the commander there at Port Royal, a man named Louis Alexandre de Freix de Minaval, well, he knew that this was a bad idea. He was an accomplished military officer in his own right. Minaval served in the last war alongside Marshal General Turin, and actually John Churchill at one point. Minaval wanted to build a new fort on the other side of the bay before they even began to tear down the old one. And considering later piratical developments, he was 100% in the right there. But the royal engineer overruled Minaval's objections and began work on Fort Royal immediately. Now, if they had managed to finish work in a single season, you know, over the winter, it would have been fantastic. They might have repelled the English with ease. But they couldn't manage it. Repairs were taking far longer than expected. When William Phipps set sail, the fort's defenses just weren't there. The walls of the fort were mostly deconstructed. They, they didn't have walls. The guns that would have at one point set atop those walls were on board ships that were also not there. They were out patrolling elsewhere. The fort had, at that time, two dozen muskets. Total, twenty-four muskets. And the fort was manned by ninety soldiers. When William Phipps and his fleet arrived on the scene, they saw immediately that the French had no chance of putting up a fight. So Phipps raised a flag of parley and sent an emissary ashore. That emissary informed the governor that they must surrender immediately. And Minaval, who was no fool, he sent a priest and several advisers to discuss terms of surrender. The terms were total surrender, without even a shot being fired. And... You know, what else are you going to do in that situation? They had no other option. 
The French were to stand down while the English carried off all of the guns and provisions and riches held within. So it's an easy victory, right? Well, yes, but unsatisfying. I mean, imagine this. You are a devout Puritan Bostonian on this voyage in 1690. Your, maybe your sister, used to live in Bristol, Maine with her husband and her two children, and in what you see at least as an unprovoked act of horror, her husband and her sons were killed. Your sister and her daughters were carried off, and your imagination can't handle the thought. And, you know, they're still missing. They're somewhere out there. If they're still alive, you don't know what happened to them. Dead, captive, nobody can give you any information. And the culprits of this horror were a host of heathen savages and their French Catholic masters. And now, these Frenchmen, who you believe were certainly behind everything, and, you know, in fact, they were behind everything, what, they just get to surrender? What about the pile of bodies that had been left outside the fort at Pimiquid? What about the revenge you had been promised? But then there was another point of view. The point of view of those pirates, I'm, I'm sorry, privateers, who had been hired for this voyage. Now, they had no stake, no personal stake in vengeance here. But they had a very large stake in the plunder that had been promised on this expedition. You know, the privateers weren't getting paid. They were promised booty. Everything that Port Royal had to offer had been promised to these men, and then they arrived. There were no cannon, there was no treasure. They had a total of 24 muskets. It's... It's nothing. It's a total bust. And remember here that William Phipps had a reputation. He marooned that crew of buccaneers several years ago on that lonely little Bahamanian island, a crew that he had also promised plunder to and failed to deliver. So irritation, well... Anger, rage, even, was bubbling up among the Bostonians. And that rage was stoked by the privateers. They saw an opportunity in the justifiable rage of the people of Boston. They tried to convince the people of Boston to disobey orders. But they weren't willing to. They needed something, a provocation, you know, a straw to break the camel's back. It's difficult to say what set the English off here. Reports differ, but the French would have you believe that all of the English were wild-eyed, heathen, bloodthirsty barbarians. The English, on the other hand, would have you believe that they saw some Frenchmen, illegally in their view, carrying off provisions. That was an act which broke the agreement of surrender which may or may not have happened, but if it did, it might have happened from storehouses that were not to be included in the surrender agreement. The pirates, I keep wanting to call them pirates, the legitimate English soldiers, were permitted to harvest everything from the king's warehouses, but they were not permitted to take anything from those privately owned warehouses. It's possible that if the English did see supplies being carted away, it was from one of those privately owned warehouses. We don't know, and we can't know. Whatever the case, though, it doesn't really change what happened next. What follows looks... Well, it looks a lot like a buccaneer raid. You know, Maracaibo or Campeche or any of a dozen other brutal and unforgiving buccaneer actions. Except... Well, the English already held the fort. It had been surrendered to them. They didn't have to fight their way in. Sometime in the mid-afternoon, Phipps describes a single, disastrous musket crack. A sound that broke the quiet, pleasant afternoon. Phipps and his other commanders ran to the site of the shot, but within seconds that single disastrous shot had turned into dozens. When Phipps arrived on the scene, all he found were dead Frenchmen, but the English were already on the hunt. They were tracking down every last French soldier in the fort and killing them. 
The French did attempt to put up a defense, but they didn't have any guns. The English had their 24 muskets. Phipps arrived in time to, had he the authority, put an end to that fight. But he did not have the authority. Even if he could have talked his men into laying down their arms, the French weren't going to just surrender again. Phipps felt he had no other choice but to let this play out until all of the soldiers of Port Royal were dead. That's what I mean when I say that William Phipps failed to exert any proper oversight on this mission. But that's just the beginning. Things are about to get a lot worse. Once all the soldiers were dead, the Englishmen left the fort behind and entered into the city of Port Royal proper. Now, Port Royal wasn't huge by standards of the day, but it was sizable, and the English defiled it. Naturally, the church was desecrated. Protestant Englishmen enjoyed destroying Catholic churches, but they were also typically the richest places in town. All of the tithes collected by the church, all of the rents paid to the church, all of that was somewhere within. Not to mention their religious symbols, which were usually forged of precious metals and often encrusted in gemstones. Phipps recalled, quote, We cut down the cross, rifled the church, pulled down the high altar, breaking their images. And then he concludes, quote, They kept gathering plunder, both by land and water, and also underground in their gardens. End quote. Had the Englishmen stopped at the church, it would have been an affront, certainly, but not an atrocity. But, of course, they did not. At first, they focused on the warehouses, the king's warehouses, which they were permitted to sack, and the privately owned warehouses, which they were not. That would cause, well, quite a bit of diplomatic fallout after the fact. But at the moment, they had this haul of beaver pelts and provisions and even a number of treasures from the church. It should have been enough. And that might have been enough from the pirates, the, you know, privateers who were there after plunder. But it wasn't nearly enough for those who were after revenge. The revenge they found was... Well, it's not as bad as it could have been, I suppose. I mean... There was no mass torture, a la Francois Lolonnais, but it was bad. They focused on the wealthier parts of town. Eight or ten men would break off into a group and break into a home. There they would kill or subdue any resistance they found. With everybody held captive or dead, they would have their way with the food and the wine and all of the valuables inside, and if there happened to be any women available, they would have their way with them as well. However, that was reportedly a rare occurrence in this particular sack of Port Royal, largely because most of the women and children had evacuated as soon as the French surrendered. They were rushing as fast as possible, carrying what valuables and provisions they could to Quebec, the closest city of any real size. This... Well, England and France were at war. This kind of thing happens in war, right? Well, it does, often, but even by the standards of warfare of the day, this was beyond the pale. It's going to play a role in the days and weeks to come, but first I want to look at the immediate consequences for the English of the raid on Port Royal. They returned to Boston, victorious. You might expect them to return as conquering heroes, but again, their return looks much more like what we see among the buccaneers. They had a hall of riches to show off, a, you know, a huge gold cross, piles of gemstones, silver, goblets, and plates, and hard coin. This was a relatively new experience to the people of Massachusetts. Sure, there were beaver and codfish halls every once in a while, but this was a sudden windfall of real wealth. Naturally, the town fathers were concerned about the diplomatic but more immediate military consequences of this raid, but the people of Boston were, well, they were enjoying this infusion of hard specie. Well, they partied, in what looks a lot like what occasionally happened down in the West Indies, 
a crew of hard-living rovers blows into town to blow all their money on food and drink and women and gambling. Naturally, the house and the women of ill repute would take a cut of the profits and the economy would just, well, hum along. Every man in town who had access to a ship and a few muskets and maybe an extended family large enough to crew that ship, well, they would think to themselves, you know, I should really invest in a commission. And they did. There was this sudden surge in privateering commissions immediately following the Battle of Port Royal. In part, that was because everyone saw just how much money was to be made. But in part, and maybe this has more of an effect, they were at war. And this particular raid shows just how real this war had become. Next time, we're going to look at the next stage in this war, as it manifested itself in Boston and New York and Quebec. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has left us ratings or reviews, wherever it is you listen to the show. Everybody who has recommended this show to your friends and family. You all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music was The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, you can check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.